It looked a lot like, well, people think that it was a ziggurat, which, you know, scholars believe, which is very similar to many of the other pyramids that we see all over the earth that were built. And they're even discovering them, you know, they're excavating along and they're still discovering these things under the earth. And uh, it appears that people were doing this all over the earth, not just at Babel, but they were emulating or trying to do the same thing um, as at the Tower of Babel. And, you know, all of the pyramids in South America, uh, same thing, same, very same structure and the same idea. Um, so the, uh, the idea that it was not just Babel because, so the Jews had a way of, of taking a word and, and making it mean several different things and sometimes they use Babel because it has something to do with, uh, with the fact that the languages were, or uh, everybody was babbling, but also the, the word did mean gate of the gods, that's another meaning, and so this is what appear, appears that Nimrod was trying to do, was bring, well I'm just going to throw this in, and we're not even going to talk about it, I'm just going to throw this in just for something for you to think about. Nimrod was trying to bring back what was happening before the flood, which was uh, fallen angels uh, interacting with mankind, which is what Genesis 6 says in a very short little verse, uh, and it doesn't say much about it, but it says there were giants in the earth in those days before the flood and also after that. So there were giants before the flood and after the flood because of what the fallen angels did. Um, so apparently the ziggurats all around the world, they were trying to bring that, that same, uh, same thing back. And perhaps they did, but we won't talk about that today. Anyway, next slide. So here's Deuteronomy 32, and I think this one might be one we've read before. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is allotted heritage. So in, in this uh, passage, um, it's making a distinction between God's people and the rest of the people, and the rest of the people of the world. Um, and he divided mankind, and how did he do it? He fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Um, now in the King James Version, you see on the notes there, uh, says, according to the number of the children of Israel. And uh, so this is why some teachers say, well, it didn't have anything to do with the fallen angels. It was according to, you know, uh, Israel's children, which were, um, well, However many, how many do you have? He had 12. Okay, so, uh, but that doesn't fit. That doesn't work because Israel was not a nation at that point. Um, when God divided the nations, there was no Israel. Israel had not, Abram had not come around yet. And, and um, so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then the children of Israel did not exist then. So the children of Israel is a bad um, translation. So King James, you know, translators there, um, kind of left us with uh, not quite the right idea. So that's why some other translations would try to be closer to the original um, where it says, the number of the sons of God. So we, we figured out last week that the sons of God were what? Okay. And so normally whenever it talks about sons of God in the Old Testament, it's talking about, about angelic beings. So, um, oh, well, my little comment here. Guess what? Israel didn't exist when the nations were created. Okay. Next slide. 
the Net Bible, I don't know if you ever look at that, but it's on the internet, and that's not why they call it Net Bible. It's a New English translation, I believe. And it's a pretty good translation. It's got a lot of, and you can, you can get it on your phone or whatever, but it's got a lot of notes, good, good notes and everything uh, that go along with it also, and uh, you can look at it in Hebrew or whatever you want to, so there's a lot of good stuff there for studying. It says, according to the number of the heavenly assembly, so does that sound slightly familiar from what we've been studying? What? Divine counsel kind of language. Heavenly assembly. Old Testament worldview from Deuteronomy 32 from the Faith Life Study Bible. And this will be in your notes. I believe I went ahead and copied that in. Because it's important. I like it. This is from Michael Heiser. There's another really good online resource called Faith Life, Life Study Bible, and also it's, it's, you can get it with the Logos Bible, which is Bible software, which you can get the basic version for free, but I prefer the Faith Life version. It's, it's, it's got all the, most of all the same stuff. Um, comes from a company called Logos, which um, a lot of pastors use these, and they, you know you can pay big money to get a lot of this stuff. But I only use the free stuff, and I have a, there's a lot of resources there for free. Anyway, uh, Michael Heiser works for that company, so uh, he gets a, he gets to write in, in in there some of his notes, which are very good. So Michael Heiser was one that uh, one of the main ones that I got a lot of this information from. Kind of introduced me to the divine council idea. Um, so I'm going to read this here. Deuteronomy 32 8 describes Yahweh's dispersal of the nations at Babel and his resultant disinheriting of those nations, allowing them to come under the power of other lesser gods or Elohim. Deuteronomy 32 9, by contrast, states that the nation of Israel belongs to Yahweh alone. When the Most High apportioned the nations as an inheritance, when he divided up humankind, he established the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is a lot of heritage. And that's Michael Heiser's little translation there. Not that he has done a whole translation, but that's just his for that. English translation is based on the Masoretic text, which is where King James comes from. The traditional Hebrew text of the Old Testament used sons of Israel instead of sons of God. The phrase sons of God comes from manuscripts of Deuteronomy found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, scrolls much older than the Masoretic text. The reading of sons of God is also found in the Septuagint, which we will talk about a little bit later, by the way, maybe next time the ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament. The reference to the events at Babel, the dividing up of humankind in Deuteronomy 32.8, highlights an important point regarding this manuscript disagreement. The division of the nations at the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, 1 through 9 is connected to the table of nations of Genesis 10, which directly precedes it. The table of nations, that's just what scholars call it. It doesn't say that in the King James or in any Bible, uh, unless somebody happens to write it as a, as a, a title. The table of nations catalogs 70 nations, but does not include Israel. So Israel is not one of those 70 nations. This is because Israel did not exist at the time of the Babel event. This makes the reference to the sons of Israel in 32, around 32.8 an anachronistic. Sons of God was most likely changed to sons of Israel sometime after A.D. 100, when the Jewish community, partially in response to the Septuagint, standardized the Hebrew text. And then they just decided to put sons of Israel for some reason. Okay. So, um, I don't think this is Michael Heiser's part here. I'm going to make sure. Yes. Uh, 32 verse 9, when it says, Jacob is the place of his is that Jacob Israel? Yes, yeah. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel after he uh, had a fight with the angel of God, remember? Yeah. Which was God. It was God in a, in a different form, I guess. Because it talks about it. It says it was God later. It was an angel, but it was God. Um, yes. 
So his name was changed to Israel, and then, and then all of Israel became, you know, all of his sons and grandsons and all became the nation of Israel. So, uh, yeah, this is still from Michael Heiser. Um, where am I? Okay. Deuteronomy 32, 9, 8 and 9 is fundamental for understanding the worldview of Old Testament Israel. These two verses explain both the existence of the foreign pantheons, or all the other systems of all the other gods of different nations, which Anthony has, has become an expert on, right? <laughs> and their inferiority to Yahweh. Totally inferior, because he created them. A parallel passage to Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, which is Deuteronomy 4, 19 and 20, provide some context, so here's that. And do this so that you do not lift your eyes toward heaven and observe the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, and be led astray and bow down to them and serve them. Things that Yahweh your God has allotted to all of the peoples under all of the heaven. But Yahweh has taken you and brought you out from the furnace of iron from Egypt to be a people of inheritance to him as it is this day. Deuteronomy 4, 19, 20 and Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9 represent two ways of describing the ancient Hebrew conception of world religions. This is where they came from. Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9, God apportions the nations to the sons of God. Here, however, God allots the gods to the nations. Israelites, in other words, believed that Yahweh, their own supreme, unique God, essentially sentenced the nations and their gods to each other. They were punishment to each other, for each other. At Babel, Yahweh, like a father dismissing and disinheriting his children, judges all the nations for their disobedience. Then in the very next chapter, he calls Abraham, effectively starting over and creating an earthly human family for himself. So, uh, all these gods, well, no, okay, I'll keep reading this at the end of my eyes. These other gods, which Deuteronomy 32 8 refers to as the sons of God, were members of Yahweh's heavenly host. Scripture elsewhere condemns both the members of the nations and their gods for disloyalty and corruption, showing that these foreign gods are fallen members of the heavenly host. So, uh, one thing I just want to point out is <clears throat> when uh, it talks about the all the stars of heaven, the sun and the moon and the stars and all the hosts of heaven, um, and don't bow down to them, they did actually think of the, of the stars and they thought of them as being uh, re either representations or actually they thought, you know, those were their gods floating around up there. <laughs> and that's the way the pagans looked at it. So whenever you, God says, don't worship all these, the, the pagans really were worshiping these as their gods. They weren't just worshiping the sun, but they were worshiping a god in, as the, the sun was there, was a being. That, I mean, they believed it was a being that they were worshiping, not just the sun that they worshiped. Um, so, next slide, I think. So that's not me. <clears throat> so, uh, 70 nations answer the 70 questions. So, according to Canaanite religion, there were 70 sons of El, which was what they called their God, which is very close to Elohim, they're, you know, um, very close to the, the same language. And that's because they were all in that same. Uh, Let's see what you call it. Ancient Near East. They were all part of that, and uh, many of the languages were very similar. <clears throat> so, so El, their God, there were 70 sons of El who gathered on Mount Hermon, which was the Canaanite Mount of Assembly. So, uh, sometimes God talks in the Old Testament about the Mount of Assembly, where he gets together with his divine council. Well, guess what? In the Canaanite religion, uh, they talk about the same thing. They, they had their god, which was El, which is not Yahweh, but they were retelling the story um, 
And that's why a lot of people get messed up thinking, oh, this is the same thing. But they were retelling the story with their own gods, and it was not the one true God. So, and they met on Mount Hermon. <clears throat> this is one of the many distorted pagan views after the Tower of Babel incident that were similar to the biblical account. And by the way, there were various accounts throughout the world that tell the Babel incident and other related stories, but Moses set the record straight in the Old Testament. So when Moses told the story, that was from God, and that's the bottom line. That's what really happened. Um, but all the pagan nations, and they're still telling, telling the story, stories today, and believing that their God is their God or gods, pantheon of gods, are the true gods. Um, and I don't know if you've ever, let's see, what's, there was a movie, uh, okay, Zeitgeist, you ever heard that? Okay. Well, Zeitgeist was a, a kind of a YouTube video that actually caused a lot of Christians to fall, or people who might have believed in the Bible to fall and to, and to start believing in uh, some of these other gods, or at least believing, well, Christianity is just another story, just like all these other ones. And the name of the movie is called Zeitgeist, and then the guy has, has come out with Zeitgeist 2 or whatever. And, but anyway, it's all... Um, it's all looking at it from the same point of view that um, all these other stories are just as valid as the Christian uh, story and the, and the Old Testament story. And uh, he was wrong, but a lot of people have been led astray with that. Let's go to the next slide, please. So this is a very similar story. 70 elders went up the mountain with Moses to meet with God. This is in Exodus 24. And um, let's see, I'll just read that really quick. Then he, Moses, and he, God, said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nabab, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come with him. Then Moses and Aaron, I'm skipping. And Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. They saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness, and he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. That sounds like quite an experience, doesn't it? So, uh, actually, <clears throat> There were 70, and then if you add um, Moses and Aaron, you've got 72. So you can either look at this as a 70 or a 72 incident. Um, so from Derek Gilbert in The Great Inception, which is one of the other books that I mentioned, um, I got some good information from. He says, for the first time since Eden, not including the burning bush incident, of course. Humans were in the presence of Yahweh on his holy mountain. This was an early taste of the reconstituted divine council. So this was uh, kind of the, the, first, the first run of that reconstituted divine council with loyal members of, uh, of, of the human race, which, you know, these 70 uh, elders and Moses and Aaron, um, who were loyal to God, and they got to be in God's presence. So it was a, a little divine council meeting on, on a mountain, Mount Sinai. Um, so, why did God choose 70 or 72? Why do you think? What? It's a big thing, and it has to do with the um, with the, the the fact that the nations were divided up, divided up in seventy, with seventy fallen angels for them. So anyway, Derek goes on. How many elders of Israel were there? How many nations did God create after the Tower of Babel incident? How many sons of El in the assembly of Mount Hermon? Seventy, seventy, and seventy. Coincidence? No, 
It was another message to the fallen. A day is coming when my people will again take their place in the divine council. So, that was God's uh, message and Moses' message. To the powers, principalities and powers that Paul talks about. We're talking about the same guys as what Paul was talking about. This is where they came from, those principalities and powers. Okay, and uh, next slide. One more. Sorry, I forgot to tell you about that one, <laughs> to go there. Okay, the Canaanite version <clears throat> reminds me of Paul's words where he says, Romans, in Romans 1.5, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And of course, that word creature can also be creation, anything in creation. Um, <clears throat> so when they worshipped, when they were worshipping angels, whether it would be, I mean, some people uh, kind of advocate worshipping what they might think of as good angels, you know, angels that follow God. Well, you're not supposed to worship them either. It doesn't matter if they're fallen or not fallen. You don't worship angels. <laughs> and... Um, <clears throat> and though, because those are creations, that's actually part of the creation. Even though they're spiritual beings, they are part of the creation. So we don't worship and serve the creation; we worship the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Paul says. Okay. Uh, next slide. Let's look briefly at the seventy bulls that were sacrificed at the Feast of Tabernacles. This is just an interesting one. Um, I think. Just, you know, when you see a 70 in the Bible, it's got to mean something. And it's always related to the, this, the first 70. On the 15th day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall keep a feast to the Lord seven days. And then I'm just going to make this, uh, this is the short version. <clears throat> On the, okay, there's seven days, right? So... First day, 13 bulls sacrificed. Second day, they were told to sacrifice 12 bulls. Third day, 11 bulls. Fourth day, 10 bulls. Fifth day, 9 bulls. Sixth day, 8 bulls. Seventh day, 7 bulls. And guess what? If you add those up, what do you get? 70 bulls. So it was, it's <laughs> very good. You guys are getting it. Um, so it was kind of hidden in there, you know. Somebody had to do, some mathematician had to get in there and, and add all these up and say, hey, this must be related, because there's 70. And it was over a period of seven days. So, can anybody come up, I mean, without looking at the notes, can anybody come up with a reason why this might happen? Why God would tell them to sacrifice seven bulls? Okay. Well, I probably didn't either, if I hadn't read a book or something. But anyway. Uh, so, coincidence? No. <clears throat> the number 70, or 72, for the nations, etc., is more about the totality of the pagan pantheon than an exact number. In other words, it might have actually been 70 or 72 nations right then, which were in that uh, ancient Near East area. But uh, now, we have many more nations. Do you think all of those 70 angels are all divided up to, for all, into all the nations, over all the nations of the world? Well, I don't think so. I think it's many more. I think there are you know, plenty of fallen angels to go around who are over all these other nations. Do you think there's a fallen angel over the United States? I'll test your patrioticness. Dana says yes. The United States? Huh? Yes, the United States. Is the United States Israel? Is the United States God's nation? No. <laughs> the United States has a mixed history of paganism and Christianity. Paganism has been actually very, in different ways, secret societies, presence, and other ways, has been very instrumental in guiding our nation along with Christianity. It's been a fight all along, just like it was with Israel. You know, Israel would go back and forth worshiping false gods and, and worshiping Yahweh. Um, so yeah, the United States, Israel is the only one 
that God took for his inheritance. God was their inheritance and Israel was his inheritance. All the other nations, including the United States. I know we like to think of the United States as a Christian nation, but um, it, you know, and I'm not, I'm not being Barack Obama that says this is no longer a Christian nation, okay? Uh, <laughs> I am simply saying that we have to be honest about where we are and where we've come from, our history of our country. There was plenty of pagan influence. Um, so the 70 bulls would not, was not a sacrifice to the other gods, you know, as if Israel had to for some reason sacrifice to other gods besides Yahweh. It was, and this is what I think, and this is what Derek Gilbert thinks, it was celebrating the deliverance from the wilderness, which is where evil lived, and it's represented by the 70, See, because the 70 went out all, all around the earth, or, you know, out in that, the rest of the world at that time, uh, which was considered the wilderness by Israel. I mean, they lived in the, they ended up in the promised land. Um, so anyway, um, it the 70 bulls celebrated their deliverance from the wilderness and into the promised land, which is where God's presence and blessing lived. That's what the Feast of Tabernacles celebrated. Deliverance from the gods of the nations. So that was a big deal. That was a big reason for the Feast of Tabernacles, which is celebrated when? Does anybody know when the Feast of Tabernacles is celebrated? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's celebrated in the fall. And of course, on the Jewish calendar, it changes all the time. You can't just say, well, it starts on September such and such. Um, because it changes with the way their calendar goes by, um, eh, I think it's by the moon. But I believe the Feast of Trumpets, which is called Rosh Hashanah, you know, on your calendar, if I says Rosh Hashanah or Feast of Trumpets, if it says it at all, and I believe that started just last uh, Monday. So. The beginning of the Feast of Trumpets just started, and that is that is part of the Feast of Tabernacles, and then it, it goes on from there. Um, so it's always in the fall. So it was celebrating their deliverance into the, from the wilderness into the Promised Land, and away from their deliverance from those 70 nations and the gods of those 70 nations. So next slide. Did I go to the next slide? No, hold on. Okay, 34. So we need the next one. There we go. So this is one reason for Zechariah 14, 16. There's, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes into why this verse is. Um, and my famous book, which you've probably never heard of, uh, talks about this. Because I do go into the feasts a lot and how how they are very important to what the church, to what God has planned in the church. Anyway, here's Zechariah 14, 16. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So in what we call the millennium, it's the it's when God, when Jesus restores his kingdom to the earth, um, which we believe is going to happen, I believe is going to happen, and I really don't think it's going to be that, it's that far away in, in time. But um, why do you think then that in, during that period of time, when, after Jesus' kingdom is restored on earth, why do you think they're not celebrating the Feast of Passover or the Feast of Pentecost. It just says they're going to, all the nations of the earth are going to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. <laughs> what don't, was the don't be afraid, huh? What was the question? Why, in this verse in Zechariah 14:16. Why are all the nations going up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, but not in the other two feasts? 
They're only celebrating this one. They won't get any rain. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good reason. Yeah, they won't get any rain if they don't. Um, so, again, the same the same thing that we just said about the uh, what the Feast of Tabernacles is all about. It's because all of the nations, not just Israel, but all of the nations, basically, will be uh, free from the the pagan gods, free from the bondage and corruption of the fallen angels during this period of time. So they're celebrating, every year going out and celebrating, hey, we're free from those 70 angels, symbolic, uh, but really all of the fallen angels. So during that time, it's a good thing to celebrate. Um, next slide, please. Exodus 20, verse 6. Okay, 70 nations answer 70 questions, mostly. Uh, Exodus 15, 27, in the King James says, And they came to Elam, where were twelve wells of water, and threescore and ten seventy palm trees. Threescore and ten equals seventy. And they encamped there by the waters. What do you think this means? Twelve wells and seventy palm trees. What do you think that has to imply? Or it must imply or symbolize something, right? Here it is again, 70. And 12 is an important number, too. Did, were you going to say something? Yeah? No. I thought you were. Well, to be honest with you, I listened to Michael Heiser with the podcast. He was um, interviewing another guy. And the guy had written a I don't know, a book or something about these about the seventy trees. And then they really they really didn't talk about seventy until the end of the podcast. And and Michael Heiser said, So what do you think? Why do you think the seventy is in there? Because the guy was just talking about trees, how important trees are in the Old Testament. Um, trees are symbolic in the Old Testament. But the uh, so actually Heiser is still thinking about it, trying to say, oh, the seventy trees must mean something. And of course, 12 is a number that's very important all through the Bible. Does anybody have any any thoughts on that? 12, huh? 12 tribes. 12 tribes, okay. Um, it seems to have to do with the people of God. And then I just, I just ran across something that basically says it has to do with the government of God too, divine government. So, um, which um, the people of God, will be taking over the divine government are in the process of we are and uh, more in the future so 12 and 70 gotta mean something but we i'm not even gonna try to say sure what that means next slide please i just had to throw it in that's a bonus a bonus without an answer uh, okay so here's another one another one that i think is significant um, Exodus 1 5 in the King James. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. So I think God is saying the same thing that He's been saying with these other 70s. Um, Israel is the beginning of the end for Satan and his fallen angels that rule the nations. So Israel was God's beginning, you know, where uh, God disinherited the nations and then He gave himself Israel and gave himself to Israel. And that was the beginning of the end for these um, fallen angels that are still over the nations. So next slide, please. That was just another bonus. Because I don't think I had that in my little, little sheet. Here's another bonus. The Septuagint, it, they also call it the LXX, or, you know, which is um, Roman numerals four. Seven. Seven. Very good. So, um, is a translation of the Hebrew Bible, in, this is from gotquestions.org, is translation of the Hebrew Bible into the Greek language. The name Septuagint comes from the Latin word for 70. The tradition is that 70 or 72 Jewish scholars were the translators behind the Septuagint. The Septuagint was translated in the 3rd and 2nd centuries B.C. in Alexandria, Egypt. Um, so, this is me speaking. The New Testament writers quoted from the Septuagint 80% of the time. 
So, 80% of the time when you are reading uh, Paul or, or Peter or whoever quoting an Old Testament verse, they're quoting out of the Septuagint. So the, really the Septuagint was very important to our, to our New Testament theology because uh, that's what they were using. And Jesus, too, of course, uh, he also, I'm sure Jesus knew the Hebrew and knew the Hebrew Bible also. Um, so why do you think the tradition is that there are that there were seventy translators of the Septuagint? There were seventy nations. I, I would say so. You know, maybe it was a hundred, maybe it was fifty, but I think the Jews really wanted to say it was seventy because because it just is another statement to the fallen angels and the. Uh, the pagan nations. So um, God was probably behind that too, you know, even though it was a Jewish Jewish decision. Next slide, please. Let's see. I better see when I where I quit. Where do I quit on, on <laughs> number two? <laughs> I'm not going to get past. Okay. Okay, basically I just said this. They're probably thinking of the 70 or 72 nations that were created by God, or the elders that went up on Mount Sinai to meet with Yahweh, or the 70 souls that came from the lines of Jacob, or all three. That was all three in their heads, and they thought 70 is a good number for translators. The nations and God's answer, answer to the nations and the gods that rule over them. And this would all be related to this divine council concept. Next. Snap. <coughs> We're almost done today. Jesus sent 70 disciples. And this was in our, in our little sheet. So I'm going to read Luke 10, 1, and 17, and 20. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 also, other 70 also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whither he himself would come. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So there we have it again. Jesus chose 70 disciples. He must have, he must have read the memo. <laughs> so another statement. Uh, let's go to the next uh, slide. For illustration purposes, in the NIV and the ESV and the Net Bible, and others have 72. So you may see 72 sometimes, you may see 70, depending on the translation. Uh, 70 and 72 are speaking of the same thing, going back to Babel and um, Sinai. So here it is in the NIV, Luke 10, 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two. So just for an example, uh, and this is from Michael Heiser in the Unseen Realm. He says, Jesus sent out 70 disciples. The number is not accidental. 70 is the number of nations listed in Genesis, 10 that were dispossessed at Babel. The implications are clear. Jesus' ministry is the beginning of the end for Satan and the gods of the nations. The great reversal is underway. So when he sent out 70, he was sending a statement to the gods of the other nations, which are fallen angels, the angels that rebel. Did I go to the next part? Uh, nope, that's it. That's it, okay. So we are going to end on, we are going to start on page number 42 slide next week, or week after next, actually. Probably next week. So that's what we're going to do.